The subject of this story is a formidable hunter on whose empire the sun is now setting. Millions of years of evolution made him the largest feline on the earth. And for thousands of years he reigned supreme, ruling over the other creatures that shared his world, until one of them rose up against him. Man turned the tables in the kingdom of the tigers. We changed the rules of the natural world. We became the strongest, the most aggressive, and the most prolific. The setting for our story is an overpopulated world that has usurped most of the territory of the tiger. A stolen kingdom in which man, previously fearful and reverent towards the great feline, is leaving him without territory, without prey, without a future. A world of superstitions for which each one of the parts of the powerful feline represents a remedy for frustrations, impotencies and illnesses. Traditional lies that are killing off the last tigers. This is the story of a fight to the death, a battle between men that will decide the future of the tigers. Without time for long-term plans, only direct action can halt the otherwise inevitable extinction. It is a war with innocent victims on both sides, an international struggle in which tigers and men die as a result of the immortal greed of the invisible traffickers who run the illegal trade in the different parts of the tiger. This is, in short, the story of one species' fight to save another, of man against his dark side, of the belated attempt of one super predator to help another, who he has brought to the very edge of extinction. In the state of Madhya Pradesh, in central India, the Kana National Park has become one of the last refuges for the Bengal tiger. Ahimsa, a three-year-old tigress, has recently taken possession of her own territory. The park researchers who give names to the tigers in order to make it easier to monitor them, know that the new tigress lost two of her sisters to the poachers and a third as a result of a cobra bite. Luckily, Ahimsa has found an empty territory inside the park and, under its protection, her possibilities of survival have greatly increased. Even so, the dangers have not ended. The marks on the trees reveal the presence of a territorial male a male that the new tigress will have to accept within her domains. A small village in the far east of Russia is visited by the inspectors of the police department and the anti-poaching patrol. Так, разбросанные предметы. Первая лёжка. Vladimir Shatinin, head of the patrol, questions the locals and sends his team to inspect the village. The tracks seem to confirm the attacks of a marauding tiger. Ой, какие светлые. Нападение было на меня. To the expert eyes of the patrol, a few hairs, fresh tracks, and broken gates and fences indicate where the tiger entered. The blood on the ground confirms the fears of the villagers. The tiger has carried off a man. The 
patrol leaves the village and follows the trail of the feline. Accustomed to moving across the snow following the elusive trail of the poachers, it is not long before Vladimir's men confirm their worst fears. The barkings of the dogs tell them that they have reached the end of their search. Attacks by tigers on humans are incredibly rare, and it is even rarer that they do so in order to eat. Vladimir and his men suspect that something must have happened to the animal. Whatever the tiger is like, it has turned into a man-eater and the mission of the patrol created to conserve these extremely rare felines is now to seek out and kill the tiger. Under the protective cover of night, a risky encounter takes place in the depths of the forest. infrared camera reveals the approach between a female tiger and a male, a promising encounter in a region where there are almost no tigers left, but one which is nonetheless full of dangers. If the male does not accept the female, he could kill her, and so the first moments of the encounter are marked by tension. Fortunately, the tigress is receptive and the male seems to accept her in his territory. With numbers in clear decline, each one of these encounters could be the key to perpetuating the species in this the most northerly region of the Siberian tigers. Even so, the female will play hard to get, forcing the male to undergo a test of patience and submission. With the first rays of the sun, the male has succumbed entirely to her charms. The smell signals of the female let him know that she is ready to mate. Ten days of courtship will still be required before the female will agree to copulate, but with a bit of luck, it will not be long before new tigers are conceived. The actions to protect the tigers have gradually changed since the first alarms were raised approximately two centuries ago. Since then, the defenders of the tigers have seen how the problems that threaten this feline have diversified, and the battlefronts of this war have multiplied. Promoted by the Indian Wildlife Protection Society, this demonstration seeks to make the public aware of the terrible problem of the international trade in ivory and tiger bones. The main threats are no longer hunting for pleasure or the fur market. The demand of traditional Chinese medicine is decimating the populations in Russia and India now that the number of Chinese tigers has fallen so much that they are considered an irrecoverable subspecies. Countries like China, North Korea or Japan permit, to a greater or lesser extent, the trafficking in parts of the tiger, and new threats appear every time a battle is won in this endless war, a war that began over 100 years ago. Jai Singhji, the last Maharaja of Alwar, built this palace in 1902 in the forests of Sariska, his favorite hunting ground. Today, Sariska is a national park that protects the last tigers in Rajasthan, and the palace is a hotel that houses the visitors. 
The war of the tiger is changing with the years. The battlefronts have moved and former enemies are now allies. Sariska is an example of these changes. Here, the Maharajas of Alwar held great tiger hunts. Of those times, all that now remains are the moth-eaten trophies that decorate the rooms of the palace. Everything else, including the huge tiger populations, have disappeared in time. Then, India was a country of endless jungles in which tigers were free to roam. Initially, the hunting for pleasure did not represent an unsustainable pressure until the jungles began to disappear and the tigers were gradually left without territories. However, now a new phenomenon has begun. The tiger is killed not for its skin but for its bones. Because of the belief in the Chinese system of medicine that tiger bones have some kind of an aphrodisiacal quality. Uh, this is an old belief because the tiger is a very virile and a very strong animal. So tiger bones are supposed to make you very strong and virile. Now today what is happening is tigers are being still being poached. The skins are allowed to rot. There is a big trade in tiger bones and tiger parts. Now this is a very disturbing thing because uh, uh, first of all as I said um, earlier the first threat to the tiger was the egos of the British and the Maharajas who thought that it was a big deal to kill as many tigers as possible. The second threat to the tiger became the vanity of women because they wanted to wear tiger skins and the third threat now seems to come from the insecurity of men because they seem to feel that they need aphrodisiacs and they need tiger bones to, to, to help them perform better. So it is unfortunate that the tiger gets clobbered uh, whatever happens. The words of Dr. Karan Singh, the creator of the most successful project for the conservation of tigers of all those carried out around the world, sum up a century of growing threats for the tigers. Hunting for the skins has given way to hunting to obtain the internal organs of the tiger with supposed medicinal properties. What began as a sporting challenge is now an unstoppable trade, an international trade that is killing off the last tigers on the planet. The main uh, use for tiger parts are they're, they're killed in India and then the bones are smuggled across the border um, either from um, India into Nepal and then into China or directly from India into China and usually they go as whole bones and in China they're processed, they, they grind up the bones and make them into to different medicines. There's also a tiger wine which um, is it's preferred if, if there's a, a, a chunk of bone in the, in the wine bottle and then you can keep topping it up for years. Um, and there are tiger plasters and tiger pills and, and the tiger penis is very popular. There's a sort of like a soup that's made and, and things like that. Now these, these are all traditional Chinese um, so-called remedies. There is no scientific proof that they, they help in any way. It's just as well to, to take an aspirin or something. Um, but they're used by um, the Chinese community mainly, a lot of Japanese as well, for oh, lots and lots of ailments. Rheumatism is a major one, a general tonic. Some parts are used as an aphrodisiac. Um, and there are many, many different things that it's, it's used for. And there is, I think it's something, I mean, horrifying, like one billion potential users of tiger bone medicine. This was the distribution of tigers barely two centuries ago. Take a good look. It was like this for thousands of years. From Asia Minor to Southeast Asia, eight subspecies of tigers shared the world with us. Today, only five remain. In the course of two centuries, man has decimated the tiger populations. The species of Bali, Java, and the Caspian have disappeared forever. Of the five remaining subspecies, one, the Chinese, is irremediably condemned to extinction. And today, without local tigers, 
Traditional Chinese medicine looks to the tigers of India and above all those of neighboring Russia, where there is little control, for supplies that could, in just a few years, wipe out the Amur tiger or the Siberian tiger. Vladimir Shatinin's men continue their search. The tracks of the man-eating tiger lead them deep into the forest, and its smell has not yet disappeared, enabling the dogs to follow its trail. Finally, a stealthy movement alerts the patrol. The tiger is there, lying in the snow, and without hesitation, Vladimir's men complete their mission. The man-eating tiger is dead. For men who risk their lives to protect these great felines, killing one is a sad, demoralizing task. But the attitude of the tiger lying in the snow and its behavior in the village make them suspect the animal was wounded. Wanting to discover the reasons that turn the tiger into a danger for the local villages, Vladimir's men remove its skin. Shortly afterwards, the bullet that ended its life appears. And, a little later, the guards find the confirmation of their suspicions. They remove thick pellets from the body of the tiger. The animal has received a pellet shot that did not kill it, but did leave it seriously wounded, with its hunting abilities impaired and in terrible pain, which undoubtedly made it mad with rage. Now, Vladimir Shatinin's team has a new mission, to find the poacher that caused this tragedy. While in Siberia they are looking for the culprit, in the safety of the Kana National Park, Ahimsa, which in Hindi means against violence, explores her new territory. Despite the fact that Ahimsa is not yet in heat, the local male, who has already smelled her trail, accepts her in his domains. A female with two cubs needs between 40 and 70 large prey a year, which in many cases means dangerous competition for the male. But in Kana, the prey are very numerous, and the tiger is happy to accept the new tigress. With a stable population of large herbivores, the park enables each male tiger to have a territory of around 100 square kilometers, in each one of which up to five females can live. The determining factor in the extinction of the tigers of the Caspian, Bali and Java was the disappearance of their prey. Fortunately, here in Kana, the striped felines still enjoy the natural balance of the India of the past. For most of the tiger populations of the world, however, prey are increasingly scarce. Barely 15 weeks after mating, the tigress that met the male in the far east of Russia has given birth to two cubs. After mating, the female and the male went their separate ways, and she has not seen him since. She will raise the cubs alone, and will take care of them for the next three or four years, until they decide that it is time to become independent. A female with cubs needs an average of between 8 and 10 kilos of meat a day, which means over 3,000 kilos a year. For the new mother, the challenge will be to feed her children. And that challenge will be even greater at this time of year. 
The air carries the unmistakable smell of the highlands, smells that anticipate the harsh Siberian winter. In the winter months, hunting becomes increasingly scarce and more difficult. The world is paralyzed and prey and hunters alike must survive a period of scarcity, an annual test that many will prove unable to pass. In lower regions, the end of the autumn announces difficult times. Our tigress knows that her cubs face the hardest test of their short lives. Hunger is a threat, and in this region where government is virtually non-existent, the tiger's prey, like the habitat in which they live, is progressively disappearing year after year. Knowing that the life of her children is at stake, the tigress goes out hunting. Fire is the greatest enemy of the Siberian tigers. Intentional fires are destroying the territory of the tigers. Some years, up to two and a half million hectares are burnt down. And with the loss of their habitat, the tiger's prey disappears. With increasingly small and increasingly fragmented territories, the tigers are concentrated in their last refuges. And paradoxically, though there are very few left, in these small remaining areas their numbers can be so high that they rapidly wipe out their natural prey. Then, inevitably, the tigers seek alternatives. Hunger makes them overcome their instinctive fear of man, and old problems reappear. Domesticated cattle is easy, tasty prey for a tiger. Once they have seen how easy it is to get, the tigers return time and time again for more. The owners of the cattle are in turn poor people whose subsistence depends to a great extent on their animals, so they come out to defend them, causing clashes between tigers and humans. And it is then that the tigers may discover that there is another prey, even more numerous and vulnerable than the cattle and so they end up becoming man-eaters. For the tigers of India, the loss of their habitat and consequently of their prey is also the most serious problem. Inside the national parks, the tigers are safe, but the edges of the parks are often areas greatly coveted by the local people. The jungle conserves the humidity in the soil, two increasingly scarce factors, but two vital factors for subsistence agriculture. The majority of the one billion inhabitants of India live in the most absolute poverty. Cultivating a little land, obtaining a miserable harvest, represent a short-term future, but the bare minimum for survival. The edges of the parks are burnt and cut down in search of the humidity of the soil. Day by day, the desert encroaches, isolating the last oasis of jungle and life. In a country whose land has lost almost three quarters of the humidity of its soil, the wood of the forest and the animals of the jungle are the only possibility of life for millions of Indians. And the problem also has other aspects. The same farmers that burn and cut allow their cattle to graze in the fertile interior of the parks. The cattle decimate the vegetation and introduce diseases that devastate the populations of wild herbivores. 
it is a disastrous combination. The felled trees no longer retain the humidity and the cattle inexorably destroy the plant coverage on which the wild herbivores depend. The rains disappear, the soil is lost, and a powerful enemy takes over. The desert. It was precisely in a national park surrounded by deserts that the Asian lion was saved from extinction, which was achieved thanks to the fact that the lion was the national animal of India. And this provided the inspiration for Karan Singh to undertake the even more ambitious project for the conservation of the tiger. I discovered that the national animal of India was the lion at that time. Now, as you know, our national symbol has the four lions. There's a marvelous column from Ashoka's time showing the lions, which is why the lion was probably adopted as a national animal. However, it struck me that lions in India are found only in one state, in Gujarat, and there are only about a couple of hundred lions, whereas the tiger uh, was at that time and still is widely dispersed throughout India from the north to the south and from the east to the west. So I suggested at my initiative that we should change the national animal of India from the lion to the tiger. And that really set in motion this whole process of the uh, tiger project. Because once we adopted the tiger as our national animal, then of course the question arose with regard to tiger conservation. And I discussed the matter with uh, Madam Gandhi and she was very supportive. Uh, she said, what would you like to do? I said, I think we should have a special project to uh, save the tigers from extinction. The success of the tiger project is based on the understanding that in order to save the species, we have to protect its habitat. It was no longer a question of watching over and caring for a given animal but rather of saving the jungles in which the tigers lived, along with the prey they need to feed themselves. A pioneering vision which today guides all conservation projects. It isn't only the tiger you safeguard, because once you safeguard the tiger, it means you have to safeguard the ecosystem which supports the tiger. So that's what we did. And we started off with nine projects and it has now grown, I believe, to about 18 or 20 uh, tiger reserves. And at one stage, it uh, was the most successful conservation project in the world because the tigers had been hunted to the verge of extinction. Uh, our estimate was that in the year 1900, there must have been about 50,000 tigers in India. When we started Project Tiger in the early 70s, uh, there were hardly 2,500 or 3,000 tigers left. In the interior of the last refuges of the Siberian tiger or the Amur tiger, teams of scientists take samples and carry out censuses of the tigers. This is part of an ambitious project financed by conservationist organizations from all over the world, especially the World Wildlife Foundation, aimed at saving the Siberian tiger. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, there has been an alarming decrease in the numbers of Siberian tigers. Across the Chinese border, which lies close to the last refuges of the Siberian tiger, the poachers have opened up a very lucrative trade route, taking advantage of the lack of means of the Russian Wildlife Department. With international funds, the Siberian tiger project is fighting against this illegal traffic. While the scientists investigate in order to create an appropriate conservation plan, new patrols and new teams are joining the fight to save the tiger. In Russia, India, Indochina, or any of the other countries that still have tigers, 
The situation of the tigers of the world is so alarming that constant monitoring by the guards is necessary. The territorial nature of the tigers makes it easy to monitor them and to carry out censuses. But the jungles in which they live are not easy places to move around in. In many parks, the elephant is the best, safest vehicle. But when the trail of a poacher is detected, great care is needed, and the men must enter the territory of the tigers on foot. A wounded tiger and an armed poacher are equally dangerous, and that means that the park wardens require exhaustive training, something which costs a lot of money. The conservationist organizations provide part of the budgets, but the parks are now becoming increasingly self-financing. In the early hours of the morning, a group of tourists has climbed up onto the back of an elephant and is about to enter the interior of the jungle. These tourists have come from all parts of the world and have paid considerable sums of money to be able to see a tiger in its natural environment. And by doing so, they are not only financing the protection of the tiger, but are also helping to increase worldwide awareness of the need to conserve the species. When these travelers return to their countries of origin, they will attract new visitors and will create a sense of affinity with the cause of the tiger. And because they bring foreign currency into the region, the locals will also begin to value the tiger and the environment in which it lives. Vladimir Shatinin's team is following the trail of the poacher that killed the tiger. The traffic in tiger parts is centered on Vladivostok, and it is here that Vladimir's men, in coordination with the local police, make their first arrests. This poacher has not been in the region of Primorsky Krai recently, nor does he use the same ammunition as that which killed the tiger. But the information they manage to get from him leads them to an apartment in Vladivostok. Having obtained a court order, Vladimir's men enter the apartment. There is plenty of incriminating evidence, but the patrol is looking for something else. Finally, thanks to an identity document, they are able to put a name and a face to the poacher they are looking for and, what is more important, shortly afterwards, hidden in a cupboard, they discover a map. Now Vladimir and his men know where they must head for. Several months after her arrival, Ahimsa is now familiar with every corner of her territory. Now, her smell markings contain additional information information which the wind carries through the thicket of Kana announcing that the tigress is now in heat. In the depths of the jungle, someone picks up the message.
Ahimsa continues her round of signaling, and when she comes close to the male, he answers the call. Ahimsa had smelt the male, but had never seen him. He, larger and stronger, represents a risk for the tigress. But at all times her suitor is attentive, and it is not long before Ahimsa agrees to mate. Over the next five days, they will copulate almost 200 times, thus ensuring that the tigress will be impregnated. Here, in Kana, there is territory, prey, and a future to receive these new cubs, and the tiger project again brings hope to the species. Our young mother has finally managed to find some prey. It is her job to turn the meat into nutritious milk, and so, until she has eaten her fill, every time her children approach, she fiercely warns them off. With the meat that she has managed to get, the cubs are guaranteed food for a few more days. But if we look a little closer, we will see that their luck is only apparent because what the tigress is eating is a cow. The lack of natural prey and the ease with which she can kill a cow mean that the tigress will be back for more. The cubs, in turn, taste the meat of domesticated cattle, and this will gradually become their usual prey. When they are capable of killing, they too will probably look for cattle and it will simply be a question of time before the owners of the cattle seek out and kill the tigers. Vladimir Shatinin's patrol has finally found the poacher's camp. A rapid inspection shows them the path he took on his hunting expeditions. They are closing in and the chase is coming to an end. Across the frozen snow, they make quick progress, and the trained dogs don't take long to pick up the trail. Once again, the barking alerts the patrol. On the ground, beneath the snow, lies a backpack and a gun. Vladimir's men know what this means. The chase takes a more dramatic turn. The two pellet cartridges of the shotgun have been fired. This can mean just one thing. In these lands, no one abandons his provisions and his weapon. Now, the patrol is looking for a dead body. A few meters further on, an irregular mound attracts the attention of the men. The war of the tiger shows its most dramatic side. The poacher lies beneath a layer of the most recent snowfall. Vladimir's men decipher the last moments of the poacher. The man shot the tiger but did not manage to kill it. Wounded, the tiger attacked him and, in an act of desperation, the hunter tried to defend himself with his knife. The first blow must have broken his neck, saving him further suffering. Then, the tiger fled, overcome with fear and the pain of its wound. And that unfortunate shot claimed three victims, the man from the village, the tiger, 
and the poacher himself. That is the tragedy on the front line of a cowardly war in which the guilty parties hide in the safety of their countries, far away from the territories of the Tigers. New perspectives are opening up in the war to save the Tigers from extinction. A new awareness is being created throughout the world and new sources of financing bring fresh hope. But meanwhile, with the human population continuing to increase and a growing market in tiger bones, the war continues to claim victims and this makes it necessary to take immediate, drastic, determined action. There is no time to waste. And even people who are criminals who are not involved in this trade, now become, because it's become so profitable, um, have, now, have now gone into this trade. And it's a bailable offense. If you're in drugs you don't, and you're caught, you, you don't get bail. If you're caught with, with uh, tiger bones, you can get bail. And this is something we're fighting through, through the system, but uh, so far have not succeeded. Battles are being won, but for the time being, the worldwide situation of the tigers continues to get worse and the tiger continues to lose in this war. So today, the situation again is, is not a happy one. Our population has grown, the pressure on the environment has grown, uh, there is increasing deforestation, desertification, and the tigers really are being squeezed into, uh, into smaller and smaller areas. While awareness is being raised and alternatives generated for the future, the front line of action needs the financial backing that will enable it to continue halting the massacre. The potential market of traditional Chinese medicine is almost one billion consumers. Those that profit from it are almost always untouchable. But in the line of fire, we all lose. The tigers lose, the local people lose, and the poachers who risk their lives to obtain the minimum that will enable their families to live with dignity also lose. Despite all the efforts, all the subspecies of tiger continue inexorably down the path towards extinction. And the battle is far from over. Perhaps, in the world that we are creating, there is no room for the power, the greatness, and the freedom of this lord of the jungle. But for many people, the world and mankind itself would suffer an irreplaceable loss if we were to lose these magnificent felines forever. <laughs>